Every December, we hear a good amount of stories of people or groups that are trying to take Christ out of Christmas. A couple of highlights. A mom in Arkansas sued her son's public school for putting on a production of A Charlie Brown Christmas. When asked why, her lawyer said, well, because that's an overtly religious presentation. To do that at a public school doesn't just blur the line between church and state, it jumps right over it. In Hawaii, a group of public schools would get together and have a Christmas concert. It was all secular, nothing Christian. And like five, six schools did this because it was a fundraiser. And to get the message out, they would use local churches. They would hand out flyers and things like that. Churches did nothing except help publicize the event. Well, the Hawaii Center for the Separation of Church and State did not like that. They said this was an abuse and it shouldn't be happening. They threatened a lawsuit, so they canceled the concert. And just so you know, the money raised at that concert, six figures, was always used to help starving children in Africa. In Santa Monica, maybe you've heard of Palisades Park, for years they had, well, a nativity scene parade, I guess you'd call it. They had 21 slots, and what they do is you could bid to get one of those. It was a way of making money for charity. And if your bid won, then you could do your version of the nativity. Some did a more uh, classic one, some did like an updated modern one. Well, the atheists didn't like that. So they put a full court press on, and they got 18 of those 21 slots. So instead of 21 nativity scenes, there were three nativity scenes and 18 atheistic whatevers. Some of them openly went out of their way to mock the nativity. As you can imagine, many people were ticked, so what did the city do? They just banned nativity scenes on public property. A Christian group had to counter sue, but it was thrown up by a federal judge. In Los Angeles, there's a huge apartment complex, high-rise. Well, people who live there got a message saying, we will not be putting a Christmas tree in the lobby because that's obviously a religious symbol. At Western Piedmont University, there's a lot of student groups that would sell things to make money again for charity. Well, they were warned, you can't use the word Christmas in any of your advertising. What were most of the groups selling? Christmas trees. And at a school in the Florida Panhandle, for years and years, there had been a beautiful nativity scene out Somebody complained, and now Frosty the Snowman is there. You know why it seems like we're hearing more and more of these every year? Because it's happening more and more every year. I don't know about you, but my initial response when I see this is is anger, frustration, kind of like, what is happening with the world? But quickly, what comes after that is almost an apathy. Like, well, what are we going to do? What can we really change? We'll hope things get better, but they probably won't. That's easy to fall into, right? But does it do any good? Does it help anyone in any way? Does it get the focus of Christmas back to where it needs to be on Jesus? No, it does not, and therefore we can't let that stand. So as we dig into our text, I want you to keep this phrase in mind. Stand up for Christmas. Stand out for Jesus. Now, again, we're in our gospel lesson from Luke, and the main guy is John the Baptist. He was following his divinely appointed role to get people ready for the Savior. And how would he do that? Well, first of all, he would address people and their sinfulness. He would speak openly, honestly, and clearly about the fact that these are God's expectations, and here's where you have failed. Then he would call the people to repent, to come clean, to confess to God what they have done. And then, (coughs) excuse me, After that repentance, John would show them how that faith and that thanksgiving can show in their lives from here on out. And if you think about it, that is no different than what we do here. We do not give ourselves a pass for our greed or our anger or our gossiping or whatever sin it is. We call ourselves out. We come before the Lord and we repent. We ask for forgiveness. And in finding that forgiveness, we then focus on, okay, how can I now live out this faith in my life? I say all that because nothing has changed. The message has not changed, and the way that message is delivered has not changed. And again, in our lesson, we see this being put into practice. John goes to a group of people, actually they come to him, and with very strong words, he calls them to repent. If you don't know what a brood of vipers is, you don't want to be called it because it's not a good thing. He's telling the people, you have sinned, you have failed. And then he calls them to repent. 
And they do. And then in repentant faith, they say, okay, now what can we do? We want to live out what's been done for us. How do we do that? And the second half of our lesson, John addresses that. One group comes to him and says, well, what should we do? And he basically tells them to be selfless. If you have extra clothes and someone needs some, or you have extra food and someone is hungry, share with that person. Be selfless. Tax collectors came to him. And I know many of you know this, but they were hated by the people because they worked for the Romans and they made their money by overcharging the people. They come and say, what should we do? And John says, don't collect any more than you're supposed to. Be honest. And some soldiers come and they say, well, what should we do? And he says, don't extort any money, but be content with your pay. These people, they knew what had been done for them. They knew their Lord and they wanted to know how can we serve him? How can we stand up as people of faith? Now again, realize nothing has changed. What's, this, what's the second or third thing we did in the service? We called each other out on our sins. Then we repented. Then we heard the message of forgiveness through Christ our Savior. That all our sins are gone and we know we are part of God's family. And upon hearing that, doesn't the Christian in us want to ask what the people did? What do we do now? Knowing this has been done for me, how can I serve you, Lord? That is what the Christian in us thinks. And so to that Christian, I now speak. Talking about serving the Lord, what can we do now? That's something we should do all year round, but let's focus narrowly on the context of Christmas. Knowing our forgiveness and with a repentant faith, how is that going to show this time of the year? Let's go back to the three words that John used. To that first group, he told them to be selfless. This is a time of year when more people than ever volunteer for things and donate to charities. And that's a good thing. But realize this is also the greediest time of the year. There's the obvious greed for stuff, which we easily see in children, but adults let's not give ourselves a pass. Because the sinner in us, the, at the thought of having more, bigger, better, our eyes easily grow big too. I don't care how old you are. Add to the fact that we live in a world that is just pushed with consumerism, that everywhere you go you're being told you need X, Y, and Z, or else you're a loser, you're a moron, and everybody's going to make fun of you. It just makes it all the harder. So there's that greed for stuff, but especially as you get older, there's also that greed for praise and recognition, notoriety, and everybody telling you just how great you are. It is a very, very easy time of the year to be very, very selfish. But realize this also offers us a great opportunity to show selflessness Think about charities. Again, I can't even start a list because there are so many great, wonderful charities. Some that deal with physical needs, and of course the more important ones deal with spiritual needs. But I encourage you, if you haven't, look up a list of just local ones or ones within our church body. There are so many wonderful ones. That's a way to be selfless, to say it's not about me getting stuff, it's about me using what I have to serve others. Another excellent opportunity this time of year is to teach children selflessness. If you have a little one in the home or with your grandchildren, they're being told from every angle it's all about stuff. You need this. You have to get that. Well, take time to remind them they already have the greatest gift in having a Savior. And as gifts are pouring in through the season, model for them the selflessness of Jesus. That it's not about what I get, it's about what God has given me and how I can use it to serve others. When we fight against what the world is saying so, is so important, when we hold up what is the greatest gift, and when we use that gift to serve others, when we are selfless, isn't that standing up for Christmas and standing out for Jesus? So selfless. And the second thing, be honest. This might be the most dishonest time of the year, and I know that sounds weird, but think about it. What kind of messages are we told? We're told that all is well in the world because everybody's a little bit nicer to each other for three weeks. We're told that family is far and away the most important thing in the world. And while this point runs contrary to what I just said, we're also told that it is all about getting this. Whether it's a physical thing or an emotional high from somebody telling us that we're wonderful. That's the stuff we hear 24-7 this month every year. But those are all lies. 
All is only well for a person when they know and understand their identity as a child of God. Those who know and understand that Christ came into the world for them, to live and die and rise for them. Family is an awesome blessing from God, but it does not trump the best relationship we have, the one with the Savior who came to win us back. And all the stuff that we're seeing everywhere, it can do nothing to fill that God-shaped hole in our heart. Only our Savior, His work, and His love can. That's the honest truth. And that is the honest truth that brings us the comfort and peace that we have every Christmas and Advent season. We know why our Savior came. We know what it means. Today, tomorrow, we ultimately know what it means in eternity. That's the honest truth, and that's the honest truth I pray we project in everything we do. It might be a little late now, I understand, but maybe next year. Think about what you're projecting when it comes to how you decorate your house. Are you putting the emphasis on Christ and his birth? If you have a Christmas party coming up yet, think about the music that you're using. Are you, are you standing up for Christmas and for Jesus and choosing music that really focuses it on what's important? Think about a person you know is struggling and needs your help. Reach out to them. And yes, we can give them a hug, we can do all those kind of things, but the best thing we can do is tell them the honest truth of a Savior who loves them beyond anything they can imagine. When we are honest about what the season is all about, And we are holding that out for everyone to see. Isn't that standing up for Christmas? And isn't that standing out for Jesus? Selfless, honest, and one more. This one won't take long. Contentment. That's probably the last word that you'd use to describe our society this time of the year. Content. Because as we've been saying the whole time, it's always about more, bigger, better. Never be satisfied. Keep pushing until everything you want is yours. That's the message of the world. When we stand up against that and say, no, I don't need those things. I don't need a a tree loaded with presents. I don't need everyone's praise and adoration. You know why not? Because I have a Savior. I have a relationship with Him. I have forgiveness. I have peace. I have confidence. I have hope. And I know that all my daily needs are going to be taken care of as well. When we don't join the rat race and are running here, there, and everywhere and spending all this money for things that do not satisfy... When we stand up and say, I'm content because I know what this season is all about, isn't that standing up for Jesus, for Christmas, and standing out for Jesus? Maybe the simplest way to say it is this. This This season, and every season, it's not about us. It's about our Lord, what he has done for us, and how we can faithfully serve. John the Baptist understood that. At the end of our lesson, people were wondering, is this guy the Messiah? Might he be the Savior? John could have said nothing, let them assume that, and then receive the praise and accolades that came with it. But he didn't. If you go further in the lesson, John says, look, I'm just a humble servant. In fact, I'm not even worthy to untie the footwear of the Savior whose way I prepare. John was a humble servant, and so are we. We are humble servants who gladly, willingly serve because we know the perfect, humble service of our Savior and what it means. And how does our appreciation and our thanks for that show this time of year? It shows when we are selfless, when we make it first about our Lord and then about others, and using what God has given us to serve them, especially in a a spiritual way. It shows when we are honest, when we're cutting through the clutter of what everybody tries to say is so important, and getting down to the meat, that it's about the birth of our Lord. And we do this when we are content, when we are satisfied in knowing and having my Savior, I need nothing else. Selfless, content, honest. I hope you can keep those words in mind as we finish the stretch run to the holidays. And I pray that God always gives you an ever-increasing faith that wants to put those three things into practice. Amen.